humans typical apes. Despite humans are very similar genetically to other apes, it is clear that humans are atypical in many aspects. Diversity, population size, geographical distribution and population structure. These unusual features of human population result from a distinct human evolutionary history. In the not so distant past, the prevailing view was that the humans are typical apes, but only better across all species defining features. We are faster, taller, bipedal, can talk and sing, but above all, we can have high cognitive abilities, or in other words, we can solve logical problems, and they can't. Apes appear to be primitive, underdeveloped humans. But is it really so? Let's watch this video to find it out. The scientists at Japan's Primate Research Institute, the PRI, where Ayumu is based, have devised intelligence tests for chimps. One test is for what's called working memory, the brain's ability to temporarily store and use information. The numbers 1 to 9 are randomly scattered across a touchscreen. The chimp looks at them for as long as is needed to memorize the layout. Then, as soon as one is touched, the other numbers are hidden and must now be remembered. We volunteered Chris, the director of this program, to demonstrate this test. He's a college graduate and a crossword addict, but how good is his working memory? When Chris reckons he has memorized the layout, he touches one. When the others are hidden, he must try to recall two to nine in ascending order. It takes me ages to remember where they're all placed and then I think I've got it. It's really very, very difficult. In 30 attempts, Chris only once reached nine without making a mistake. As soon as they're blanked over, it's like my mind's been blanked over as well. When Ayumu sat the same test, he correctly remembered the numbers almost 90% of the time. Ayumu gets it right almost every time, and I've got it right once. Chris fears he's let his species down. But even when the PRI played Ayumu against their best human students who were given regular practice sessions, Ayumu still beat all humans. Other chimps at the PRI have also sat the exams. Among these apes, computer skills are as normal as the ability to swing from the trees. Though none of his rivals beat a Yumu, a few came close. And average chimp results turned out to be higher than amongst humans. So, does that efficient working memory mean chimps are cleverer than humans? We tracked down a scientist who studies chimps in the wild, Dr. Nick Newton Fisher. I think it's interesting the results that suggest that chimps may have particular cognitive abilities that are different and maybe in some aspects better than, than humans because chimpanzees are not small primitive furry humans. They are a species that we share a common ancestor with maybe five, six million years ago, but they've evolved along their own individual path. Are they better at doing chimp things and we're better at doing human things? And some, th some chimp things may not simply be climbing up and down trees and eating figs. Some of those chimp things might be mental abilities as well. Chimps beat humans in their short-term memory, especially in quick visual processing of the rapidly changing and rich in details environment like leafy canopy. Can we find the roots of this extraordinary but different cognitive abilities of two species in their brain evolution? Evolution from chimpanzee's brain to the human brain uh, went along the lines of expansion and 
partially along the contractions as well. The superior ability of the chimpanzees uh, to keep and operate with the visual images uh, attributed to the primary visual cortex right here, which is uh, actually quite large in comparison to the primary visual cortex of the human. Detailed comparisons of human brains with those of our living primate relatives, including chimpanzees, have shown that the parts of the cerebral cortex involved in higher order cognitive functions, such as creativity and abstract thinking, have become especially enlarged. So we can look at the prefrontal cortex expansion right here, um, temporal association cortex expansion to this area in comparison to relatively small area here, and parietal association complex expansion right here. These cortical areas, known as association regions, match a relatively late in postnatal development. Some of the long-range neural connections that link these association areas to one another and to the cerebellum right here. And the cerebellum plays a role in voluntary movements and learning new skills are more numerous in human brains as compared to other primates. This human-enhanced network a loci for language, tool making, and imitation. Even ancient reward system, such as subcortical area called striatum, right here, the striatum delineated by the dashed line, uh, pretty obvious. This bulge is very different to the relatively small area here of the um, chimpanzees. This um, is a hub of activity for the brain signaling molecule dopamine and it appeared to have been reshaped in human brain evolution. That change most likely increases attention to social signals and facilitates language uh, learning. And um, in human brain there are two unique areas which are absent in the chimpanzees. They are called Broca's area, here shown in blue, and then Wernicke's area, here shown in red. And these two areas are completely human-specific and unique. They both related to the uh, language processing. And uh, in chimpanzees, there's a little bit of the uh, uh, homologous Wernicke's area in here, and then chimpanzees can also um, master some language. Uh, many authors have indicated an integral link between a person's will to live, personality, and the functions of the prefrontal cortex. This brain region has been implicated in planning complex cognitive behavior, personality expression, decision-making, moderate social behavior, and moderating certain aspects of speech and language. The basic activity of this brain region is considered to be orchestration of thoughts and action in accordance with internal goals. This part is significantly smaller in the chimpanzees. The underlying difference uh, between human brain and chimpanzee brain spans three levels – genes, cells and circuits. The genes – so the, uh, there are several genes uh, in the range of actually 15, not that many, um, which really differ and between human and chimpanzees in the level of the evolution. The one of them, those are uh, the FOXP2 gene. This is found in humans, uh, and this um, gene plays a role in vocal learning. Um, another gene, as RGAP2C, a unique duplicate of the, of the homologous gene that is found only in humans, increases the density of neural connections. And then NOTCH2NL, a human version of gene, um, has been three times copied in the genome and aids in the production of the neurons. So we, here below in the description, you can find the link to the uh, more comprehensive list of the different uh, the genes differently expressed in the humans and the chimpanzees. And then the cells. And let's start with the uh, von Economen neurons. These are pivotal neurons and the social emotional brain circuits in here in the cerebellum and uh, they are bigger significantly in the humans. 
in these prefrontal areas, in the cortex, prefrontal cortex, uh, many more RNA molecules are expressed um, from the uh, super evolving area, which is called HAR1. RNA that carries messages to instruct cells to make proteins is more active uh, in the synapses of the prefrontal complex, so in the synaptic areas, and then in the other primates. And then the dopamine system, which has been uh, uh, mentioned earlier, the cells produce more of the neurotransmitter dopamine in this triatom, right in the middle. So dopamine is involved in various cognitive functions as well. And uh, the circuits. Um, in, on average, the circuits in the human brains are tighter connected and more numerous than in the chimpanzee's brain. In particular, the mirror neuron system, activated at viewing the actions of others, has intricate circuitry in, in humans. Um, here, the expanded connections between two sides, Wernicke's areas and Broca's areas in here, form a vital circuit for language processing. Um, and a link from the motor cortex, right here, to the brain stem, uh, coordinates the larynx muscles, uh, a circle absent in chimpanzees and macaques, so they can't make or alternate vowels and consonants. Here, let me play a short excerpt from the uh, Steven Pinker's uh, video on the vocal cord evolution. So here, the Steven Pinker is the one of the neurolinguistic analysts from the Harvard University, and definitely worthwhile to look at his presentation. This diagram here is literally a human cadaver that has been sawn in half. Uh, a, uh, an anatomist took a saw and went zzz, allowing you to see in cross-section the human vocal tract. That, and that can illustrate how we get our knowledge of language out into the world as a sequence of sounds. Now, each of us has at the top of our windpipe or trachea a complex structure called the larynx or voice box it's behind your Adam's apple. And the air coming out of your lungs has to go past two cartilaginous flaps that vibrate and produce a rich, buzzy sound source full of harmonics. Before that vibrating sound gets out to the world, it has to pass through a gantlet of chambers in the vocal tract. The throat behind the tongue, the oral cavity above the tongue, the cavity in, in, uh, formed by the lips, and when you block off airflow through the mouth, it can come out through the nose. Now, each one of those cavities has a shape that, thanks to the laws of physics, will amplify some of the harmonics in that buzzy sound source and suppress others. We can change the shape of those cavities when we move our tongue around. When we move our tongue forward and backward, for example, as in i, e, i, e, i, e, we change the shape of the cavity behind the tongue, change the frequencies that are amplified or suppressed, and a listener hears them as two different vowels. Likewise, when we raise or lower the tongue, we change the shape of the resonant cavity above the tongue, as in, say, uh, i, a, i, a, once again, the change in the mixture of harmonics is perceived as a change in the nature of the vowel. When we stop the flow of air and then release it, as in t, k, b, then we hear a consonant rather than a vowel. Or even when we restrict the flow of air, as in f, s, producing a chaotic, noisy sound, each one of those sounds that get sculpted by different articulators is perceived by the brain as a qualitatively different vowel or consonant. Now, an interesting peculiarity of the human vocal tract is that it obviously co-opts structures that evolved for different purposes, for breathing and for swallowing uh, and so on. And it's an interesting fact, first noted by Darwin, that the larynx over the course of human evolution has descended in the throat so that every particle of food 
going from the mouth through the esophagus to the stomach has to pass over the opening into the larynx with some probability of being inhaled, leading to the danger of death by choking. And in fact, until the invention of the Heimlich maneuver, several thousand people every year died of choking because of this maladaptive arrangement of the human vocal tract. Why did we evolve a mouth and throat that leaves us vulnerable to choking? Well, a plausible hypothesis is that it's a compromise that was made in the course of evolution to allow us to speak. By giving range to a variety of possibilities for altering the resonant cavities, for moving the tongue back and forth and up and down, we expanded the range of speech sounds we could make, improved the efficiency of language, but suffered the compromise of an increased risk of choking, showing that language presumably had some survival advantage that compensated for the disadvantage in choking. You can see how developed the human vocal system is in comparison to the chimpanzees. The humans and their abilities to make sounds rivaled only by the birds. So our biggest brains make us humans. This is very obvious. The last common ancestor that humans shared with chimpanzees and bonobos lived six million years ago. And after two lineage splits, uh, a number of evolutionary adaptations occurred. Bipedalism, stone tool making, and notably an increase in brain, in brain size in certain hominin species, a process that gained momentum as time passed. So let's compare the brain size across the hominins. Uh, Australopithecus africanus combined human and apes features. Its brain volume of 470 cubic centimeters was akin to that of the chimpanzees. This is the time span uh, where those species flourished and then went extinct. Then Homo erectus distinguished itself as a tool maker, crafting hen axes and expanding its home environment outside of Africa. That is the longest lived um, Homo uh, genus of all, so and in particular Homo species, uh, Homo erectus. Um, so it lasted almost two million years and just went extinct 150,000 years ago. Um, Neanderthals. Neanderthals lived alongside our species and was an avid hunter, tool and fire user. Its brain case at 1440 centimeters was comparable to in volume to our own and it went extinct 40,000 years ago so that was the lifespan compare it with the homo erectus um, homo naledi right here existed at the same time uh, with neanderthals and erectus uh, was a newer member of the human lineage whose story demonstrates that evolution doesn't always move in straight lines. So its smaller brain case, about 500, uh, 500 cubics, was just smaller than both Homo erectus and Neanderthal. And um, Homo habilis became one of the first members of the genus Homo, genus Homo. It had a smaller face uh, than its ancestors and developed frontal areas linked to language. So, talking uh, Homo. And eventually, Homo sapiens merged 300,000 years and uh, evolved about that time ago. Our brain shape is more spherical or globular because of the rounded shape of the parietal area and uh, cerebellum which is right here. Since humans adapted to bipedalism and moved more and more to the plains of savanna with the vast blue sky above them and the endless spacious expansions in front of them, the focus of mental activity had shifted more towards longer-term analysis, planning ahead, navigation and communication, 
rather the instant reaction to rapidly changing visual cues. Obviously, since human chimps split, we went through our own species-specific passes in evolution. Those chosen passes of evolution defined our adaptations, which are primarily rather changes in range and quantity, and not in quality. And surprisingly, we are not that far from each other. In the next part, we are going to look at the genetic background, determining our similarity and differences.